Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a video for you that's a little different than usual, but um, I want to address actually uh, some questions sent to me by uh, another YouTuber. Uh, this is uh, Professor DC. He is starting a, uh, a knife-related magazine in the Spanish, and one of the people he wanted to interview for his magazine was me. Thing is, though, I type all the time. That's like what I do all the, every day, all day, and I'm kind of tired of typing, so I asked, hey, can I make a video to respond to these things? And he said, sure, yeah, absolutely. I said, hey, can I make it public? He said, sure. So, here were a couple of questions that he asked me and that I figured some of my viewers might be interested in too. So his first question was, um, who's Nick Chavez and what blade and watch define him most in this moment and why? That's a really good question. Who am I? I don't really know. Like, that, that's a weird question, I feel like, to ask a, a human, right? I, I'm Nick Chavez. I'm a gear reviewer. I'm a fashion blogger. I, I, I am a multifaceted, if you will, and I'm also a scientist. I'm also a random jackass. I'm a person who cares deeply about my wife and the people in my life. I'm a person, basically, I guess if you had to find a defining characteristic, I'm a giant freaking nerd who wants to leave the world slightly better than I found it, right? Um, so that's, I guess, who I am, although... I mean, there's probably a different question or different answers, but I, I don't know. What blade and watch define me most? Um, that's a really difficult question because I, I look at my tools as being... They are certainly a reflection of who I am, right? Although I'm much bigger than my tools might otherwise think. <laughs> uh, but no, I, a couple of things that do, I think, define me pretty well at the moment. Um, To start with, uh, this guy right here. This is the uh, Grand Seiko uh, SBGE001. And I think there's a lot to this um, in terms of defining me. It is needlessly fancy. <laughs> at some level, that is 100% true. It is, it is polished where it doesn't need to be polished. It is absolutely a beautiful thing. You, whoa, zoom all the way in. In there. But, I mean, what we see here is this is a little fancier than necessary. It is also more accurate than necessary. I, one of the things I love about this guy is that it is a spring drive movement, so it is more accurate than it needs to be, which is not actually crucial. Um, it's an overperformance, but I think it's an overperformance that makes sense. I'm precision-minded in a lot of ways, and so having this bit of precision on me, um, I can take a lot of it. I can take a bit of a beating, so to speak. Not necessarily in the physical sense. Let's not try that out. But just like like this has a long power reserve, and so it can hang in there for a while, and apparently so can I, although, boy, I'm tired of hanging in. And it's trying to keep a track of the world around me with the GMT hand. And look, if there's a metaphor in trying to keep things smooth with the spring drive, it's weird to define myself in terms of gear, but I think that's a reasonable choice. In terms of a pocket knife, it's tough to say. I mean, maybe, whoa there. It is something that will shock approximately nobody. The Sleash Bowie is actually not a bad approximation. Because, again, it is fancy. Absolutely 100%. It is sort of trying to carefully design life. It's trying to be relatively minimalist, although still ending up with a whole lot going on. And it is function forward, right? I mean, uh, although this is a beautiful knife, and it is a, but it, it, fundamentally its goal is to cut things well, and it does a, a pretty good job of that. So I would say that maybe these two pieces of gear are defining me pretty well at the moment, but you could make some other arguments. Um, when did the hobby emerge? What triggered it? Um, I've talked about this a little bit in my past, um, but the, the, the biggest thing to know about the the, the 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 hobby is that I've kind of always been a gear geek, right? I've always been a little bit of a gear fetishist, just generally speaking, with anything that I do in my life, right? I am the person who, you know, uh, my binoculars broke, like for, for watching the birds and whatnot, and I, um, I spent hours and hours researching them, trying to find reviews. No one's reviewing binoculars that well that I'm aware of. Anyways, and so I, you know, this has always been a part of me. I've always, you know, worn weird, carried things that make me more prepared. This has just kind of been a thing. When I realized, you know, it was maybe, ooh, I don't even remember now, but it was 2011, 2010, that I sort of realized, holy crap, there's a high-end pocket knife world. And by, by that, I meant more than like 20 or 30 bucks, right? That, that there were better knives out there than the one built into your Leatherman already. And that was sort of the rabbit hole. Um, and so once I started looking into like, oh my God, Benchmade, then what's a Sebenza? That's so expensive. If only an idiot would buy that. I don't think I said that outright, but I might have felt it for a moment. But that's kind of, that sent me down the, the, the rabbit hole. Reddit's R Knives, and then later on, R Knife Club, REDC, all of those kinds of things let me know that this world existed. And then I fell into YouTube, and I fell into the rest of the world and started watching folks like Snuggle Bunny uh, has been around for a while, Skelton. 
Again, on the high-end stuff, I still don't play in his range, right? Uh, it's a whole thing. But yeah, I would say that's kind of, it's always been there at a low level. But uh, once I discovered that there was this world and that it really flourished, when it really flourished is uh, <laughs> when I got a new job, like when I got out of grad school and I could afford more stuff, right? Because like I, I carried the sleeve Bowie for like three years as well. I don't know about that timing exactly, but for a long time, just because I couldn't afford to buy another knife, right? So, um, but uh, the, the, the availability of a little bit more money after grad school made things a lot better. Who are my major influences and why? That's a great question, too. We've got a lot of good questions here. Um, great influences, number of people, um, the click and clack the Tappet Brothers. Um, a number of people have said, oh my God, Nick, you know, you kind of remind me of the car talk people, and there is no compliment that brings me more joy. If I could be an eighth of the entertainer that those two jackasses were, I mean, a heck, a, a sixteenth of the two of them combined, right? I, that would be amazing. I absolutely loved that show, and, um, you know, rest in peace and whatnot. I, oh man, car talk was amazing. And so, I, I try to do my best to kind of at least borrow parts of the style that I appreciate, keeping it lighthearted, not being afraid to laugh at myself, etc. Because let's be real here, I'm freaking ridiculous. So if you're not, if you're not willing to laugh at yourself, right, you're going to have a bad time. But they, so I would say as, as a YouTuber, uh, they, they, they are a major influence. Other uh, major influences, a lot of the really high-end tech reviewing folks out there, like John Syracuse in, the, uh, in the, the, the tech world, did these amazingly detailed reviews of each version of Mac OS as well of laptops, things like that. I really appreciated that. Um, and so the tech reviewing world has had a major influence in me. In fact, Ars Technica is the source of the good, the bad, and the ugly as a um, as a reviewing medium. I added the great in there for the symmetry aspect. Actually, at the advice, although he didn't think I was reading it, um, uh, of a viewer, um, just because he posted it on a forum, not because I was, like, hacked into his email. I'm not his FBI agent, right? But anyways, um, you know, so there's that. And then I think just sort of maybe my biggest influence is just kind of looking out at the community and seeing what's missing, right? Part of the reason I review and part of the reason I review in the way I do is because I saw holes, right? I saw like, okay, there's nobody reviewing for just random everyday jackasses. There's no knife reviewers out there who are giant nerds talking about these kinds of things. So that was an, that was, that was an important thing. Um, in the struggle deciding whether something is a gem or not, who or what internally has the last say? Oh, that's brutal. So, okay, um, a couple of questions here. As I'm looking at something, as I'm holding something and, and examining it that I and thinking, you know, wow, okay, this could be a gem. It's the MBK EZC 1.5. And by the way, I don't want to, you know, spoil anything or anything like that. But, you know, the questions I'm going to be asking myself for gem status are, uh, you know, not super shocking. Like, is it good? Oh, yeah, better freaking be really good, right? It, it better be absolutely excellent, and it better be towards the top of the list, right? It better be toward a, a piece that really uh, floats to the top, so to speak. Um, not necessarily if you toss it in water, um, but it floats to the top in terms of the market. It had better have some kind of a compelling thing that's bringing me joy. In this case, a really impressive action, a, a really good slicey blade. A really competitive price point. But I have something that's pushing me out there to the top. Um, and the, more and maybe most importantly, you better not have anything that's a big issue, right? And I'm willing to be some flexy with this, right? Be some flexy. Like, for instance, that you know, the TRM stuff. TRM Neutron. Here, I'll pull that up in a second. Um, TRM Neutron 2. Where the heck are you, bro? I know you. I own you. You're around here. Good boy. Where did I put that freaking knife? Either way, DRM Neutron 2 is around here someplace uh, in time. Whoops. <laughs> you would think a man wouldn't lose knives, but here I am in the middle of my office knowing it's within 10 feet of me. Anyways, I digress. Um, the DRM stuff, really hard to get, right? That's a major ugly issue, but it's something that's fixable, right? And it's something that's a, a fact, an external fact of the piece. So I'm willing to accept external ugly a little bit more relative than I'm willing to uh, accept something that's just like a massive design flaw, right? And so if all of those things add up, if it's got something that's making it really compelling, independently, you know, above and beyond, like, is there are pieces out there that are just really good, but then again, at the end of the day, I don't give a crap, right? They're really good, but like, there's nothing making it separate. All of those things come in there. As for the absolute last say in the gem thing, I think a big part of it is fairness, right? I kind of think about it in terms of, you know, if I were to put this up against some of the other things I've called gems in the past, does this stack up? 
And sometimes it can be like, I really want to like this, but I don't think it does. And on the other hand, it can also feel like, I don't really like this piece, but it really does stack up, so therefore I have to give it that title. At the end of the day, it's more an internal thing. It's kind of a, an emotional state, um, which is why I, I, I kind of resist the idea. People say, why don't you assign like a numerical value to each piece that way? And the thing is, no, I'm not super interested in doing that because that's trying to make something more numerical and objective than it actually is. So I think it's kind of an emotional state. Uh, so that's a really good question. Some have said this is the golden age for knives. Where do you think the knife world is going? Where I, where I think it's going, in a lot of ways, I think it's going in the right direction, right? I, as terrible as it is, I think the, I, I'm sort of hoping that the, 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 the COVID um, whole situation here, uh, and more specifically, the loss of some of the major trade shows, uh, or at least for, for a little while, has pushed the knife industry into a little bit more agile footing. Right? I mean, I know production schedules is still a thing, right? But one of the big things I'd love to see is the knife industry kind of breaking away from some of the outdoorsy stuff, and more specifically from like the shot show style world. The knife industry, I think, has a major problem in that historically all of the marketing has been going towards the bearded badass, mustachioed marauder, that kind of world, right? The, 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 the EDC classical kind of thing, the person who's got 15 brass knuckles, two handguns, two knives, and, you know, very often... It, it, that's one world that they can advertise to, and it's a great idea, but I think it's leaving behind a whole bunch of random jackasses who are just living their daily lives and could use an edge tool, right? Um, you know, a lot of people who are outside of the traditional EDC fold, um, and I think they're missing a lot of that, and so I'm sort of hoping that a little bit of that separation from the conventional trade show, outdoors, hunting, shooting, sports world that's been forced on them will sort of push them, will push some of those companies in that direction, and in fact, we see that from companies like James brand. We see that from Quiet Carry to Ulet, where the marketing is very distinctly outdoorsy, rather than being tactical, rather than being high-speed, low-drag, and rather than playing to that idea of, you know, oh, well, I want to be a badass, so if I buy this knife, will I be a badass? I hope so. Um, and so I kind of hope that that's where the community is going. Um, I, I hope that we're looking at a golden age that is not based on making better knives for the tactical crowd, but that is, make on, uh, that is based on making, and more importantly, advertising marketing and moving towards some of the more people, some of the people that are more in the mainstream, so to speak, just to other people in our, our greatest society um, who could really use an edge tool, because seriously, I think everybody could use to have an edge tool handy with them on a pretty regular basis, right? Um, so to me, at least, I think that's where I'd like to see the world going, is more towards a broader audience and then, you know, still work with the tactical folks, that's going to be a market always, but trying to expand, trying to make pieces that work in a greater variety of worlds. And I think we're seeing some of that already um, with the resurgence of traditionals, with some of the smaller patterns, as well as some of the more kind of whimsical sorts of stuff out there in the world. I definitely hope we're going that direction. Um, so that's good. Also on the budget end, I think that's a, another area where you can go to move that direction. It's going to be a tough sell to get somebody to a $400 Monday if they've never owned the pocket knife before, right? So there, there's an on-ramp. But yeah, that's how I would go there. Um, do you favor any knife geometry, shape, model, or brand? Why? Oh, that's a biggie. Um, any knife geometry? <laughs> thin, right? Um, for my life, for my daily tasks, a nice thin blade, meaning thin blade stock and relatively thin behind the edge, is going to be a win for me. It's just going to perform the kinds of work I have to do a little bit better. That's not universal. There are going to be people out there for whom a pry barish blade is definitely a win. Not for me, though. That's that's not my world. Um, so I definitely prefer that kind of geometry. Um, in terms of models, uh, I mean, I, I, you know some of the pieces I like, right? Delica, Neutron, Atom, uh, that kind of world. Um, and in terms of brands, um, a couple of them do jump to mind, of course. Um, Spydeco has a tendency to make knives I like. They've made a bunch of knives I don't like. They have their gems. They have their junk, 100%. But they, they have a better, I think, better chance than most to make something that I'm really going to appreciate because they focus a lot on cutting. They do a lot of thinking about ergonomics. They do a lot of the things, they, they are very function forward, and that's something I appreciate very much in knives. The other one that I, 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 I do, by God, I'm going to find a TRM, even if I can't find the freaking Neutron 2, which is around here someplace. Oh, that's because I was looking for the wrong set of scales. It was right in front of me. I just changed it from carbon fiber to micarta recently. 
Anyways, um, but TRM, uh, Three Rivers Manufacturing, is another company that I'm really liking lately because, again, they are focusing on the slice of food. They're focusing on making really nice, relatively simple price points, uh, uh, knives, that is, at reasonably competitive price points, and they're doing it in the States. So this is another company that I am a big, big fan of lately. Um, TRM is definitely a thing. I like that CRKT pushes the envelope a little bit. They try designs that are a little bit more adventurous than some of the other companies, although Spydeco definitely does that. Monterey Bay Knives is another Another company that's been doing a lot of good stuff lately. Um, they, they tend to be, a lot of their stuff is sort of in a pattern, right? I mean, this is the ZC 1.0. Uh, this is the WC, or I'm sorry, 1.5. This is the WC. I mean, they've kind of got a type, right? And that's because Ray Laconico is involved, and he's kind of got a type. But MBK is another company I'm totally interested in lately. Um, they're definitely a big fan of. And like Brian the Doe um, is another person, shot by design, who I've been really respecting lately. What is the most single important thing that helped me develop taste or eye for quality knives and gadgets? <laughs> Going, handling them. I think that's the, the best answer to this. If I were to give one piece of advice to anybody starting on YouTube, it's just handle a bunch of stuff. I've said this before, but you will learn more about pocket knives by going to a local knife shop if you've got one, or a, a shop that has a bunch, or perhaps, you know, going to a show if you can manage one and they're going on, right? If you can get the Blade Show, you will learn more about knives in that weekend than you will do any other time in your life. It, it is eye-opening, because you will get to handle a bunch of stuff. You'll get to see a bunch of stuff. You'll get to say, oh, okay, now I understand what the difference is in smoothness between TRM and, for instance, Chris Reeves Sabenza, right? Why Why do people talk about this as being a little different from that? You'll get a chance to see, uh, you know, different cutting uh, tools, get, get a chance to see what you like, what you dislike, etc. The more time you spend with these tools, the more you learn about them, the more you learn about how to differentiate them, the more you start to spot things quickly, like, okay, is the clip over texturing. You'll start to be able to very quickly evaluate and sort of have have a, a mental checklist. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a typed up one like the Nick Shabazz Excellent Pocket Knife Checklist, which is available at nickshabazz.com slash checklist. Um, but nonetheless, that is a, um, that's definitely a thing. Um, so I, I would say the biggest thing that's helped me develop my taste is just handling a bunch more stuff right? Um, there's a review where a bunch of stuff comes across my table and I get a little better at evaluating it and also understanding what I'm going to like and what I'm going to dislike ahead of time. Although I try not to let that guide what ends up on the channel altogether too much because that could be a form of bias. What mistakes are we making as knife reviewers? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we as knife reviewers, it's a really big uh, group there, right? There are a bunch of people who are making, who are doing a bunch of things that are good, great, bad, and ugly, right? Um, there, there, there have definitely been some mistakes I, out, out there. There have been some mistakes that I've made, right? I, I started off talking before I knew quite enough to talk about some of the things I could talk about. There have definitely been some videos I've taken down because in retrospect, God, I didn't know enough to say that. So, um, you know, I think there's definitely knowledge-wise going off half cock ain't a great idea. But, um, you know... So I think there can be that, but I also don't want to be gatekeepy, right? At the end of the day, this is a passion-driven kind of thing. If you got a passion for gear, go ahead and start talking about it. Worst case, you delete some old videos that were out of trash. Um, other mistakes that come up every so often, um, I think there is definitely uh, a, a tendency for people to over basically to turn into a science what may actually be an art, what might actually be a creative process, right? Um, I'm very sensitive to the fact that I am not as scientific in my, my, my gear review life. Uh, frankly, I'm not very scientific at all. I'm a subjective you know, dude, right? Um, but a lot of folks will try and go that route. They'll start doing sciencey things. They'll start incorporating numbers and things like, and some numbers are perfectly like, you know, measurements and such, absolutely fine. But when you start getting into things like where you're trying to do testing and things like that, I think there, there can be a, a tendency to overestimate your uh, your precision, so to speak. Um, that's one thing I've always appreciated about Pete from Cedric and Gear and Outdoors is that he's very upfront about the fact that he's doing some tests. They can give some data, but it's not like, oh my God, you know, run a regression, that kind of thing. Um, I think understanding the level of control that you have as you're doing those kinds of testing is really important. And, and it's a thing that can help you avoid some embarrassment in the future, right? You know, you got to tune your claims basically to the power of your data. And that's an important little detail there. And that's one mistake I've seen made. And that's one mistake I've seen bite people in the, uh, 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the, the, those are some of the big mistakes. They're just like not necessarily knowing what you're supposed to be doing and um, uh, then kind of overestimating the precision and then, you know, be, pretending, if not pretending, but sort of making some assumptions that you're more scientific than perhaps you actually are. And that's that, that can be a little bit dangerous, provided that you're, you're making claims that are bigger than your data support. Right. Um, so uh, the next question is, you're a sound scientist. Yeah, I am. Um, how does this influence and what role does it play in my content channel? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, at some level, it doesn't play all that much role. I mean, <laughs> I totally know, you know, <laughs> what these things sound like, right? Um, you know, I think having some appreciation for the, the science of knife making is helped by having some appreciation for the science of other things, right? It means that I can dive into, you know, knife engineering books or actually look at a paper if I want to. Um, and by the way, I'm going to throw in a quick plug here for Laren Thomas's Knife Engineering. Uh, still an absolutely stellar book. Um, a big, big fan of this. Um, and but you know, having a little bit of science background has helped me there. Uh, but honestly, in a lot of ways, this is part of the where I I uh, I go to escape from work. Right, a lot of what I do is uh, computery. Right, a lot of it is very fiddly little signals and trying to interpret those kinds of things, measure them, doing stats, etc. Stuff that is uh, fundamentally non-tactile. And so when I sit down at the end of the day, and it's like, okay, I got this piece of gear. Yeah, it's designed to separate something in the physical world. That's what a knife does, right? Or this is a mechanical watch. It's designed well. Okay, it's a spring drive watch. It's designed to tell me the time, but there's no digital signals. There's not like debugging or anything necessarily going on. And well, okay, this one you could make an argument has a digital. So anyways, I digress. Bad example. But there, there is an element at which I feel like this is an escape from that. This is an escape from the very abstract, very fiddly, and less than, hmm, how do I put it? And the less interested, well, ah. The less concrete, that is, that I work in in my everyday life. So, um, yeah, that's that's definitely a thing. Um, but like I said, I, I don't really, I try and keep my work and play separate, both in terms of, you know, publicity as well as in terms of just kind of uh, my, my life generally. They're sort of two different worlds, and I can jump back and forth. Um, then finally, the, the, the last question is, what motivates you to keep on going with the channel and in life? <laughs> Okay, um, what acid? We'll start off with the channel part. That's easier. Um, a couple of things motivate me. Um, one of them is I am a gear geek, right? Uh, at some level, I get excited about gear still, and especially if it's stuff from folks that I know is going to be good, like the Neutron Two here. And again, I don't, I don't want to, you know, seem like I'm tooting DRMs on too much, but they just make really good stuff. But like, no, when I had this guy in the mail, like I was legit excited, right? Even having all of this stuff I do in my collection, it's like, oh, this is probably going to be good. Spoiler, it was. But um, nonetheless, you know, there is still a level of excitement. There is still a joy of like, wow, it's a really fun watch. Oh, did I mention, by the way, I identify with this watch being needlessly thick? Because, yeah, that's a thing. Anyways, um, so part of it's just like, I, I like this, so this is a really good fit. You know, it's like, you're not an addict if you're a reviewer of the substance, uh, so to speak. That's not probably true. Um, as for what motivates me to keep going in life, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's a good question in 2020, isn't it? Um, I think I kind of touched on this earlier, right? I, I want to leave things a little better than I found them. And this can be at whatever level I'd like, right? I don't pretend I'm going to change the world. I, I ain't, right? I'm one jackass, right? There is a limited number of people I will be able to help or touch or uh, and touch, I mean, in a positive sense, not like a sense. Um, but there, there is a limited number of people who that my actions and words and whatever will be able to help in this world, and no matter how hard I try, right? And I'm not going to run for office. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, no. Um, man, I'm not going to do, you know, I, my goal isn't here to get out there and be Superman or anything like that, because I ain't that damn super. But what I can do is try and leave the little tiny parts of my world a little bit better. Uh, you know, I joke that one of the things that is great about traveling with some tools is that you can improve the hotel rooms you stay in, right? <laughs> like you see that cabinet screw loose in there, you get out the Leatherman, you tighten it up, there you go, problem solved. Hopefully you've given that cabinet a little bit more life. That's the kind of approach I want to take with the world, right? I meet somebody, maybe I can make their lives a little bit better. 
that's a win. And even, frankly, if I only change one life during my entire time, for the better, that is, um, then that's still a win, right? I just want to end up slightly ahead. And so far, I feel like I'm doing okay. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, so I guess that's what keeps me going is just like, okay, God, there's a lot of crap out there. Maybe I can help somebody. Maybe I can make this a little bit better for somebody else. Maybe I can help them just find real good gear, right? Maybe that's a beautiful thing. Maybe I can get them into watches. Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong direction. Okay, anyways, but yeah, I'd say that's what gets me up in the morning, so to speak. Uh, that and the fact that I got to make money and work and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyways, there you go. Um, I hope this has been interesting to you. And, uh, and by the way, did I mention that my Patreon patrons help keep me going too? Not just in the physical sense of it makes it worth my while, but just knowing that I've got people who support me that much are another thing that keeps me doing the channel. As well as, you know, wonderful people in the community, even like makers, little Hanks, actually. And this isn't like a paid shout out or anything, but they sent this guy to me. And, um, you know, <laughs> I, I got to say, it's kind of a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, here is a little birth certificate on it. Oh, wait, this is the other one. Um, nonetheless, you know, when I get things in the mail like this, it's just like, oh, that's nice. And they even did the acoustic pattern on the outside there. Nice. Anyways, um, so uh, those kinds of things help get me out of the bed, too, in the morning as well. But anyways... There you go. Hope this has been interesting to you. Wow, 25 minutes. My rip your wrists typing this up. But have yourselves an absolutely wonderful rest of your day, everybody, and specifically to you there, Professor. Adios. Now.